They talk about me being short, and so when I sit down and preach, it's kind of maybe you don't see me in the back. Are you in the spirit of Christmas yet? Are you getting there? Absolutely. Uh, we have a backdrop, by the way, will be up all this month for you to take family pictures. You may choose to dress up and do some uh, other things before you do that, but we encourage you to take a family picture for your uh, picture album. You know, simply Christmas just it doesn't mean that Christmas is really simple. What it means is that we simply are going to look at the story of the birth of Jesus in the Scriptures and and simply make some applications to our lives and, and how that affects us. And that's vitally important as we consider this season because this season can be swallowed up in the secular Christmas celebrations that take place. Because you see, without Christ, there is no Christmas. He is the reason for the season to use a tried and worn out phrase. Life is simple when you're a kid, isn't it? You kind of just do what people tell you or you try to. Sometimes you don't try too hard. But when you're a child, things are very simple. I have told my wife Joyce many times and my family, I grew up in a great home, and I had some of the most, uh, the best Christmas experiences of any child growing up. I can remember waiting, uh, anticipating uh, getting up on Christmas morning and looking under that tree. In fact, I couldn't wait for that most of the time. You see, when you walk down through our house from the carport through the, to the bedrooms, mine was the first one on the right. And so sometime early in the morning, 1, 2 o'clock, 4 o'clock, because I never slept on Christmas Eve, I would slip in and look in the darkness at the lighted Christmas tree to see what was under the tree. And then I would scurry back and jump under the covers and try to get some sleep and wonder, why in the world are we waiting? Let's just do this thing. But it never happened. Because, you see, I always wanted to get a black cowboy suit with two guns. And I had the boots and I had the black hat and the whole thing, even though the black hat was supposed to be the bad guy. My favorite cowboy wore a black hat, so that's what I wanted. I also remember uh, the uh, Christmas pageant at the little Methodist church that I lived just through the pine thicket. Uh, that was my home church. And we always did this. Uh, we'd pull the, the sheets across on a wire in front of the church, and we would do the, the whole Christmas pageant. And me and two of my cousins would sing We Three Kings, and our voices were changing the last time we did it. And it was, we three kings. And uh, it was not too pleasant. But we got through it and we did it. But I always looked forward to that. And, of course, we wore our bathrobes to do that in, you know. Uh, usually in South Georgia, it was very cool in the evening during December. And I can remember particularly on Christmas Eve when we would have the pageant and everything at the church that the local farmer, Mr. Alton Exley, who was a member of our church, he always went to the farmer's market, and his, whole, his pickup truck was full of crates of apples and oranges. And at the end of the pageant, all the kids, we would gather and run out because we knew going out the door, Mr. Alton was going to be standing there giving us an orange and an apple. And they were so cold, you would think they were in the refrigerator for a while. But you could smell the orange as you tried to peel it with your teeth and your hands and get into it. Those are memories that really brought some special, always brings a special thought to me. And then that magical night slipping into the living room and doing all of those silly things that kids do. Yeah, you know, it was Jesus and Santa. We didn't worship Santa. We worshiped Jesus. And we enjoyed the imagination and all of the things that went into Santa Claus. But we didn't worship Him. We knew to worship Jesus because we had been taught to worship Jesus. And that's so vitally important when we come to this season of the year. That if we don't understand it, then we just open the book of Matthew and we start reading 
And if you don't understand it today, that's what I suggest you do. Just open the book of Matthew in the New Testament. If you need a Bible, there's some in a in a bookshelf right over there. And you just help yourself take it home, put your name in it, date it, it's yours. But just read the story because it's all there. Yeah, we enjoyed all that went into the uh, Santa Claus. In fact, the singing cowboy Gene Autry, he didn't call him Santa Claus. You remember? If you'll hear it this season, they'll play it on the radio. Here comes Santa Claus. Here comes Santa Claus right down Santa Claus Lane. And he would do that. And, and he still does it because, you know, it's recorded. Y'all understand. We would sing Away in a Manger in O Little Town of Bethlehem. And today I've chosen to entitle my sermon, Joy to the World. Because that is exactly what happened when Jesus was born. You see, as a child, the waiting was worth it. And to the world, it was worth it. And the anticipation of God visiting earth called Messiah, Christ, the Anointed One, God becoming a man and visiting us for a particular reason. It's unbelievable, really, when you think about it. You see, the build-up to something so joyous was part of the special, but the very simple Christmas. You know, the world waited just like we wait as children for Christmas to get here, anticipating. Last week, Chris preached about uh, about Zachariah and Elizabeth waiting. They, they waited years and years and years to have a baby, and God blessed them with a baby. But it wasn't just any baby. It was John the Baptist. He was the trailblazer. He was the pathfinder. He was the one that was going to con- start preaching repentance and turn back to God. He wore wild clothes and ate honey and locusts and stuff, and, and he was a crazy man when he preached. Some people have said that about me, and I've definitely said it about Frank. But, you see, we talk about simple Christmas, but God's plan was very complex. Because it goes all the way back to when sin entered the world through Adam and Eve. And when John was preaching repent... The build-up to God's salvation for mankind was anything but simple. It was very complex. Years and ages of working through a chosen nation, Israel, slowly bringing his son, Jesus, into the world. Abraham, Sarah, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph in Egypt, Moses the Deliverer, all part of God's purpose and His plan to give us a Savior and to know that God is Lord of all. He worked through the ages to bring us to when Jesus would come into the world. I love the fourth chapter of Galatians in the New Testament. When you read it, when you read it, it says, But when the time was right, God sent His Son into the world. And here's the thing I want you to think about, Galatians. When the time was right, you've wondered, why, why then? Why the first century? Well, that was God's plan. When He was ready, He did it. And that's the problem with we humans, you see. We don't like waiting on God at all. We want God to do it now. We want God to do things on our own time. But He took all those years and all those people. And in Galatians it says, When the time was right, God sent His Son to redeem the world. And you know what that means this morning? That means that we are no longer slaves, Paul writes. Not slaves to sin anymore. We don't have to be. If we choose to not be a sinful person and live in slavery to sin and to Satan, then we have a way out. We have a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. And that is the most joyous news I could give you today. Joy to the world. We're going to talk about very quickly God's plan, God's power, and God's purpose for sending Jesus into the world. 
Let's talk about the joy of God's plan. A little teenage girl, 14 or 15 years old, called Mary. Mary and God's right-hand angel, Gabriel, are going to get together because God has said it's time. I want you to go down and tell Mary that she's going to have my kid. And that's exactly what happens. In fact, when Gabriel says, it says, Mary, greetings, you are highly favored. The Lord is with you. And I wondered about that. been thinking about it for a, a few weeks now, building up to this sermon. What was so special about Mary? By the way, the Bible doesn't really tell you why she was favored. But when you read it, you can, you can get that information right out of it because Mary was a young woman, 14 or 15 years old, that would do exactly what her Lord and her God called her to do. She obeyed. She didn't question God. She might have had some questions. And she, we'll talk about one of those questions. But she did it. Gabriel said, Mary, you're going to become pregnant, and you're going to have a boy. And these are troubling words for Mary, the writer says. Troubling words. But what does Gabriel, he's got this famous line he always gives, do not be afraid. Well, once the angel told Mary, don't be afraid, that was it. She was not afraid. She just wanted to know more. He says, you're going to be pregnant and you're going to have a child and it's going to be a son. And his name's going to be Jesus. See, it's all mapped out. He will be great. He will be the son of the Most High. God will give him David's throne. Now talk about a Christmas gift. David's throne. If anybody knew about David's throne, it was the Jewish nation. And you see, God had to bring his child through that Jewish nation from the lineage or the bloodline of David. You've got a bloodline. Whatever, however far you can trace it back, you have a bloodline. God put all those complex things together to bring His Son into the world through the bloodline of King David, the second king of Israel. And God said, this is a man after my own heart. And maybe some of that bloodline came down through Mary, and now Mary is a, a girl after God's own heart. I like to think about it that way anyway. And then Gabriel says, Mary, he will reign forever, and his kingdom is forever. You know what Mary said? Okay. All right, I'll do it. What about the joy of God's power? Because Mary does say to the angel, well, how am I going to be pregnant? I'm a virgin. And she was engaged to Joseph. And by the way, that was almost like being married when you were engaged. That was a done deal until this came about, and then it became a big, big issue because they were not married, but she was going to have a baby. Gabriel says, don't worry, God's got this. The Holy Spirit will make this happen. And the boy, the boy is God's boy. He's God's son. He's not just any boy, Mary. You're going to give birth to a human being who is divine and human. And his name's going to be Jesus, which means Savior, by the way. And I love what what is exhibited here in Mary. She just has faith. I mean, just faith. God's got this. He's going to take care of it. She didn't understand it. But you know what? We don't have to understand everything God's done or everything He does. When we start to question God and try to understand it, that's when we get in trouble. Wouldn't you just like to say, okay, God, I read it in the Bible. I believe it. That's it. Okay. I'm fine. That's the way Mary approached this, by the way. Doesn't mean she didn't have some troubling things in her mind and her heart. But here's what Gabriel says in verse 37 of chapter 1 of Matthew, I mean of Luke. Nothing is impossible with God. How's this going to happen? Nothing's impossible with God. 
And then Mary's reply is, well, okay, I'll do it. That's fine. The third thing is that the joy of God's purpose. Remember what I read in Galatians or quoted? To redeem the world. I want you to change that in your mind right now. God sent His only Son into the world to redeem you. Put your name in there. To redeem me. See, that changes the whole... It's, it's one thing to talk about how God came to save the world, but when you start thinking God came, He sent Jesus to do that to save me. Personally, He came to save me. It, it changes. These two people... Joseph, an older man, Mary, a young woman, chosen by God to bring the Messiah, the Christ, into the world to die and then to live again, to be resurrected from the dead. God's proof of His purpose. Joy to the world, the Lord has come. Let earth do what? Receive her King. If we have trouble with joy, because joy is not necessarily happiness, joy is inside. Joy is that thing that exudes out of us. It means exuberant, it means triumph, all those words. Look it up in the dictionary. The Christmas question is this, this morning. Okay, I've heard everything you've said, preacher. So what? What? See, the so what is you. Because if you're saying so what, then it's on you. Because God always requires some kind of action. So it's on us, each individual. This gift, this gift is yours if you will accept it. Joy can be yours if you own it. See, that's the whole thing about Christmas. That's the so what. So what is, no, your troubles aren't going to go away. I read something on the Internet this morning, and it said, you know, uh, God didn't promise to take away the stuff. He just promised to be there in it with us. That Jesus is in these things with us, whatever it might be, the problem, the issue, the difficulty that I'm dealing with. God's plan, God's power, and God's purpose, it is not automatic, folks. I've used this for 40-something years of ministry at Christmas time because I think it's the greatest way to put this in context. Think about that Christmas tree. Now, there's one over there. Just think about a Christmas tree. And the presence under the tree. And there's at least one present under there and it has your name on it. When does it belong to you? That tree can, I mean that present can set under that tree until the paper rots. With your name on it. But if you never pick it up and accept it as your gift, you never have it. It does not belong to you. I don't care if your name's written all over it and you've had special Christmas paper printed over at the printer shop with your name just one right after the other. You will never own it until you accept it and pick it up and take it. And that is... The joy of your salvation is about you making a decision. God's done all this stuff. He's done everything any, anybody could do. You must reach out and you must take it. When we drop what we're holding that is against Jesus and pick up what is for Jesus, our life becomes better. When we drop what is against God and Jesus and pick up those things that belong to them, our life can change. That is the joy of Christmas. 
I don't have to go through life sad and all beat up because God's going to be with me through Jesus Christ. I have a relationship with God through His Son, Jesus. That's what Christmas is about. Jesus has better consequences than sin because sin has bitter consequences. Most of us have tried it, and we understand that. Jesus is the gift that brings personal joy. Did you get it? It's personal joy. And the question I have for you this morning as I close, what are you waiting for? Are you going to continue to let that present rot under the tree with your name on it? Or are you going to make a decision for Jesus? That's, that's the essence of why Jesus came into the world. It was for you. God's had me preach a sermon this morning. It was for you. Believe me, it's for me too. <laughs> but it's for you. Because the complexity of God's plan, His power, and His purpose is to simply give you the best gift for your existence on this earth. Because if you're like me, you're a human, you struggle with this life. There's all kinds of things that come at you. And all I'm saying this morning is that you can know the joy of Christmas by giving yourself to the reason that there's joy at Christmas. Through Jesus. His plan can be your plan. His power can be your power. His purpose can be your purpose. To live for Jesus is to live above and beyond a sinful, bitter world. There's no doubt about it. I kind of like this. The tart, bitter lemon of sin, forgiven by Jesus Christ, becomes the sweet taste of a lemonade life. Simply accept God's gift for your life. And you can do that now. It's difficult to have joy when you have regrets. And I would say to you this morning that to reject Jesus is to accept the greatest re regret in your whole existence on this earth.